Okay, so welcome to a special segment for This Week in Global Health. My name is Katie Jackson, and I'm going to be interviewing one of my former professors from the University of Ottawa. He's based in Canada at the moment. Um, and so just one of the things that uh, I wanted to highlight with uh, with the work that he's done is some of the work uh, that he's touched upon in ethics. And he taught this before in my classes, and I know that he has a lot to say about ethics. So maybe uh, you can introduce yourself, and you can say, talk about a little bit of the theory behind ethics. Thank you, Katie. Uh, my name is Dr. Raywat Dionandan. I'm a global health epidemiologist at the University of Ottawa in Ottawa, Canada. And as we speak, it's 7 a.m. for me. That's why I look uh, a little awkward. Um, and Katie is all bright and cheery because it's in the prime of her day in Stockholm right now. But uh, as, uh, as Katie mentioned, um, I research the ethics of global health, and it's an evolving, emerging field that is only now getting some traction, which I find quite remarkable that has taken the industry so long to catch up to the idea that we need ethics. And when we talk about global health ethics, we tend to be talking about a couple of different things, possibly three different things. The first thing we tend to talk about is the appropriate behavior for individuals in the field, um, individuals from high-income nations who are working in low-income environments, what their uh, mandates and protocols should be. And the second thing we tend to talk about is the appropriate behavior attitude of the relationships between institutions or nations that are separate separated by the gulf of, of wealth. Uh, the third thing we can talk about is you know, long-term relationships and institutional relationships and things like that as well. But when it comes to uh, individual behaviors, uh, I like to look at two models. Um, the first model looks at a continuum of behavior between what I call righteous seizure at one end and ethical paralysis at the other end. And righteous seizure is where I think most do-gooding, um, heart in the right place, young students of global health start out. And that's the position that, oh my god, something horrible is happening in the world. I can't believe we're not doing anything. we got to do something right now. I'm seized with a desire to help. And that's great, except there's the old adage, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. It begins there. At the other end, after we've studied this field, a significant amount of time, we realize, oh my goodness, every time I try to do something, I end up doing harm. And we can give a lot of examples for that in a second. And so as we gravitate towards the paralysis pole, we find that I can't do anything that's ethical, truly. So where do we stand on that? The advice that I give my teams and my students is we try to gravitate towards the paralysis pole, but just a little bit off of it. So we spend a lot of time considering um, the probable and possible downstream impacts of our actions and then have the strength the moral confidence to say if I can't be confident that what I'm doing is probably ethically proper then I must withdraw right. okay. and the, yeah and the other model I, I like to apply is um, the difference between the political model approach and the humanitarian model approach so um, those two dynamics are defined thusly the humanitarian model holds that we do international health and development work because it's the proper altruistic thing to do all human beings are worthy and equal and we go forth and we do this work the political model is a bit more self-serving and holds that we do these things um, because the society that we come from has been complicit in the disparity that we observe and we are doing this work to make up for that disparity and again I hold that the second model actually gets us closer to a position of humility and therefore ethical constraint and therefore again my teams we tend to absorb the second model okay okay so you're saying that it's better kind of in a way to be a little more um, resilient to the idea of needing to do help right now and maybe take a step back and, yeah. and think about it. Um, because history has shown that almost all cases, I, I'm, I'm actually loath to think of a single case where uh, an immediate response has not been fraught with more damage than good, with the exception okay. being you know, profoundly vertical emergency situations. Okay, excellent. So um, I know that you have presented some of these situations before, but perhaps for the audience we can present. <laughs> sure, we'll give you some scenarios. Yeah. An ethical situation you found yourself in, and uh, just to present the fact that there is no right answer, and it's nice to, to know that other people are suffering the same right. ethical considerations in global health. It's, it's interesting because there's actually a movement to collect these scenarios, and uh, a lot okay. of us got cling to these scenarios. This is my say. I can't, I can't share this with you. <laughs> So now I'm, I'm giving this up freely to the world. Um, one of my favorite ones is one that uh, we encountered in uh, the interior of Guyana, 
where it's really remote uh, part of the world. Um, it's a fundamentalist Christian environment amongst this, this Aboriginal community that's forest dwelling. And uh, we arrive and we find that the community is made up mostly of teenagers because there's a large school there. And um, there's a lot of uh, premarital sex happening, unprotected sex. There's probably a small outbreaks of STDs and probably uh, pregnancy as well. Um, but the, the religious uh, conservatism of the, of the place has asked us not to give out condoms. We can talk about condoms and stuff like that, but we cannot actually share them because they believe, erroneously as we know, that um, the sharing of condoms promotes sexual behavior. Okay, so we agree to that. And um, But once we do so, the, the teenagers start following us around the village, asking us secretly to share the condoms with them because they know they need them. Now here is the trade-off, is we have made a promise to the elders not to share the condoms, and mm -hmm. now the kids want them. And so I asked the audience, uh, what do you do then? Do you share the condoms or not? And here are the pros and cons. If you do share the condoms, you have satisfied your immediate global health or public health right. responsibilities. On the other hand, you've broken some trust. So what happens mm -hmm. a month later after you've, they've given out the condoms? Well, they're back on square one. They have no condoms. They have no protected sex. And now you are not allowed back in the community because they know that it's you who gave out the condoms. So the long-term impact was actually a negative one of doing something that in the short term looked to be somewhat positive. When I present this to, to fresh students, of course, most of them will say, I give out the condoms, of course, because that's yeah. the righteous seizure mentality. It's an emergency mm -hmm. and must be dealt with now. Then the caveat to that scenario is the men of the village approached us and say, we know you're in a tough position. Why don't you leave the condoms with us? And when you leave, we'll distribute them. Okay. It seems like an easy way out, but there is no easy way out. Right. And um, if you think it through, you realize that what you end up doing is you introduce the condoms as a commodity. It's given value in this community. Okay. So in your absence, yeah. the men would sell the condoms. And you might still be blamed for having left them there. So when you make a vow to a community to adhere to their cultural beliefs and values, you're not looking for a way out, out of it. You're not looking for uh, a legal cheat. You've made a vow. Mm -hmm. Stick to that. Stick to your okay. honorable uh, your word there. Despite the immediate immediate demand and pressure, and, and like you said, the the duty you have as a, a public health professional. Right, and and for me, the underlying um, tone there is arrogance. You have to avoid the arrogance that you know best, and we all think we can avoid that because we all mean well. But once again, in the field, you're presented with a scenario where your sensibilities are insulted, and the inner ethical bully comes out, and it happens to all of us. You have to look for it. Okay. Be ready for interesting, it. interesting. So um, again, uh, I know that you've done some work uh, in ethics further along into surrogacy and and the interesting field that exists in that. Perhaps you can give a, a short overview of of the ethical considerations that perhaps we don't see coming about surrogacy. Sure. Um, if you don't know, the industry of surrogacy is worth almost a billion dollars around the world, primarily focused in India right now, and it's the act of mostly Westerners going to a country like India to buy the services of mostly a poor village woman to have your baby for you. And the tension here is that there's choice, but there's exploitation. On the one hand, um, she is freely giving up of her reproductive capacity in exchange for money. On the other hand, she's giving up something that some people would perceive to be quite intimate and special. And is that commodifiable? And is she given a good price and taking taking good care of? Yeah. Um, so it's akin to prostitution in some ways, if you want to think of it as a way of, uh, of taking advantage of someone's extreme... Um, financial yeah. state to get something out of them that maybe they'll want to get. On the other hand, is it? Are we actually yeah. giving someone an opportunity to buy themselves out of or get themselves out of a, a profound economic deficit? So uh, a long story short, um, what I've discovered in my analyses is that the, the bottom line is there's a tension between medical ethics and business ethics because this relationship is gated by the role of the clinician. Um, a clinician historically has as his or her stakeholder of the patient. His or her best, in, uh, the patient's best interests are your priorities. With a business relationship, your priority is your shareholder, essentially. Right. And the negotiation that you undertake in a business relationship is, I do whatever is best to get me the best price, so long as I haven't lied. So long as yeah. fair tra or uh, open trade and fair value is in play, so long as I haven't misrepresented my case, whatever happens after negotiation, 
that's it doesn't matter if it's fair or not. What's fair is that we've talked about beforehand. In medical okay. ethics, that's not the case. So in the case of surrogacy, you've got the clinic who's acting as a broker between a surrogate and a client. Mm -hmm. That's a business kind of setup. And the surrogate now is acting as a, a contractor, and the client is the client. And mm -hmm. there's a conflict of interest that may arise. For example, if the clinician must choose between the health of the child and the health of the surrogate, how will they make that decision? Well, the right. client is paying for the child, not for the surrogate. So, so there's a financial incentive for the clinician to be choosing one way or another. Well, that's complicated. So um, I don't want to get too deeply into that, but that's some of the tensions that we're observing. And this has to do with the emerging collision between healthcare and commerce and globalization. Right. And these are things that are going to come down the pipeline louder and larger the more we uh, proceed. Okay, excellent. Well, I'd like to thank you for your time today to talk to us about, about ethics. It was really interesting to hear all of the, the sides to it, and I will definitely, it will stay with me, this this altruism and the, <laughs> the seizure righteousness and, and the other way when you are so pessimistic about every decision and, and oh, paralysis was the word you used, right? Paralysis. So I think... Oh, that'll stay with me. <laughs> but I think it's always good to, to speak about these things and expose everybody, especially those that are looking to do an international elective, uh, perhaps in a in a you know um, low resource community, to keep these in mind. So thanks for that, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I stopped the broadcast because maybe we should do like three separate ones. Okay. That's and that good. way, it's like. That way, YouTube will take them as two different videos, which will help. Sounds good. Oh, let me let me see if I can uh, stop my recording now too. So I'll s okay. 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 Hey, everyone. So my name is Katie Jackson, and this is another special segment of This Week in Global Health, where we are going to interview Dr. Ray Dianandon, who is a former professor of mine. Um, we have our Twitter handles at the bottom here. Uh, you can tweet us any questions, um, and we can try and answer them through Twitter. This is pre-recorded, so it'll be uh, not a live interaction, but we are very happy to continue the conversation on Twitter. Um, so the topic of this interview actually is going to be getting a new perspective on some tips for starting your career in global health. So a previous episode, we uh, looked at how to get into the UN system to get a job. We looked at consultancies um, and obtaining an internship or a young professional program. So from my own experience, because uh, I've had Ray as professor before, uh, I know that he gives really great outside the box advice to getting a career in global health, which I think that some of these tips have worked. So I'm going to ask him to introduce himself and tell us his three tips for getting a job or starting a career in global health. So over to you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a professor of uh, epidemiology and interdisciplinary health sciences at the University of Ottawa. And my trajectory through the world of global health has uh, allowed me to think of at least three important avenues of exploration the students should consider when thinking about a career in global health. The first is to focus on skills, skills, skills. What skills? <laughs> Two major categories of skills. The first is communication and the second is analysis. And by communication I mean uh, obviously the ability to speak, the ability to, to speak different languages, but most importantly the ability to write. If you can write and write for a variety of audiences and write quickly you are valuable. So what kinds of, of audiences am I talking about? I'm talking about administrative audiences, government audiences, journalistic audiences, technical audiences. If you have that kind of flexibility, then you are a powerful asset to any organization. What kind of writing? Well, grant writing, obviously. If you can make money flow from the heavens, then everybody wants a piece of you. <laughs> uh, report writing is important, technical writing, and precy. Precy is the idea of summarizing large amounts of information into uh, smaller documents. Well, when I consult the governments, uh, uh, maybe 80% of what I'm doing is essentially summarizing precy writing. And the ability to do that quickly is has uh, proven to be enormously valuable in a, in a variety of contexts. That's the communication side of things. The analysis side of things is a little easier to acquire skills wise it can be either qualitative or quantitative analysis statistics is always big if you can do some kind of biostatistics well then you are valuable 
If math is not your thing, then a deep qualitative analysis background matters a lot, mm -hmm. uh, especially around evaluation. So if you can do economic analyses and evaluations and tie it to either qualitative or quantitative approaches, that's valuable because increasingly uh, impact evaluation is proving to be useful around the world. And it's amazing that it never was I've, before. I've seen that a lot, actually. Yeah, I've seen that a lot, that there are a lot of calls for evaluators, and there's a lot of jobs in evaluation. I think it's a skill that perhaps is not covered in most programs. I know. It's amazing. So, uh, uh, in fact, I, maybe I should open my own program and make some money by teaching people how to yeah. be evaluators. <laughs> so, well, it's super useful. I mean, once you do a project, you have to know that it worked, and, and it's... The end, you know, it leads to report writing. It leads to more grant money. It's an important process. Think about it. If you're working for an NGO, um, at some point they will have to report to their funders the impact of what they're doing. And uh, and if you can be that person who organizes that response, then you're valuable. And if you want experience doing this sort of thing, I tell my students: if you're traveling abroad, then take the opportunity to use your evaluation skills on a free basis. Visit a local daycare center and say, "Hey, let me evaluate your center." using whatever little skills I have for free. I will give you my report that you can use and file away if you want. And in exchange, I have on my resume, hey, I did an evaluation of some organization. I did that when I was a student. Uh, when I was a student as well, I, uh, I wrote to my local member of parliament and asked if I could write a health policy document for them. And I did. They just, I don't know what they did with it. They probably filed it away or threw it away. But in my <laughs> resume, as a student, I was a policy advisor to a politician and that actually got me places. So that's the first thing. The second okay, thing... So, so communication and, and analysis Well, skills. in general skills. Focus okay. on skills. Not so much <laughs> knowledge and perspective, even though those are important, but can you do anything? Okay. Right? Okay. The, the second thing is to be strategic with those skills and those skills choices. And by that I mean look at what the world values. Um, there's a lot of fly well there are a lot of really flashy programs out there that'll offer interdisciplinary um, skill sets that are a little bit hard to understand and to navigate they sound sexy and interesting but the rest of the world is looking at the basics looking at medicine law epidemiology mm -hmm. statistics right so stay mainstream or at least have the ability to market yourself in a mainstream method and that will open up a wider market or audience for you and if you can attach whatever skill set or identity that you think you have to a known pillar of productivity and value such as business information technology uh, or communication that's useful so let's say you are have a master's degree in global health studies if you, can, <laughs> if you can show that your master's degree in global health studies has some kind of side specialization in information technology or economics or law or finance, those are the pillars of power in the world, then you're associating your skill set and yourself with these, these elements of power. Okay, would, would that maybe be a piece of advice for, for a thesis uh, yeah. concentration? Totally, okay. uh, and I think if when choosing your thesis, I'd recommend um, having it abut these these pillars of power, and also extracting skills as you go that you think would be relevant once right. you graduate. It's not simply a, a discussion of the you know, the 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 degree of IT penetration in this nation, but what IT skills have you extracted from this process? Okay, that's okay. The, the second element. The third is to be what I call a T-shaped person. Right. So, okay. uh, letter T, by which I mean there's a horizontal component and a vertical component. And the vertical component is the depth of that skill that you've chosen to specialize in. Let's say it's epidemiology, okay. let's say it's statistics, maybe it's communication, maybe it's uh, something a bit, um, you know, uh, less commonly described, like qualitative understanding of women's issues in developing context. But okay. however you uh, um, define your skill set, be able to do so in a profoundly deep way. But the horizontal part is to show flexibility and labileness in other realms. And the reason for this is most organizations are looking to plug you into these positions that aren't just specific to your skill set, but allow you to transcend other people's job descriptions. More and more, okay. Everyone needs to be able to do several jobs at once. 
um, okay. it's cheaper for organizations. That's the way things are going. And obviously, it's best if you are not just a T-shaped person, but like maybe a pie-shaped person, because <laughs> <Right? laughs> you actually got several several verticalities. But that's a little difficult okay. for most people to to ascertain. I guess the lesson there is, don't rely upon that one thing that you trained in to get you where you need to be. Rely okay. upon that one thing, but augment it with a variety of other skills that perhaps aren't as deep as that one thing. Okay, so so kind of like be a specialist, but also be a generalist. Yeah, be everything. Be everything. <laughs> <laughs> Great advice. Just be everything. <laughs> okay, yeah. interesting. So maybe um, just to to end off, just maybe what's the what is maybe in your opinion what's the most lacking or the most in demand skill or sector that you think people could could if they have a specialty or a interest in could specialize in and become relevant. Um, there isn't just one answer. I, I've mentioned a couple of them of already. <laughs> uh, what I've observed is, um, well, business development and uh, okay. increasingly more global health and development, as you know, is increasingly less about targeting in incredibly low income populations and more about low and middle income populations right. whose needs aren't just vaccinations and public health adventure, but economic and community development. So if you have uh, skills at that level that can be translated, that's useful. Institutional relationships are more and more important. Okay. Finding a way to, to um, translate the role of health and development into the private sector. I sound, okay. like, I sound like some private sector guy. I'm not. I'm, just, I'm, <laughs> a little I'm, bit. I'm recognizing that the world is perhaps not as black and white as it used to be. And we need to cozy up to the power brokers a little bit to get things done. So um, there's okay. that. Uh, okay. But really, the the thing that I find mostly missing on an individual basis is the ability to write. Okay. And it's something yeah. we're not focusing and, and on agree. universities. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Perfect. Okay. So thank you very much for for identifying those those skill sets that we need uh, for the field, and also the maybe perhaps some new. Uh, niches that people can focus either their thesis on or perhaps look for in their job if it relates to their skills already. Um, so I'd like to thank you for your time, and we're going to end here. So thanks so much. Thank you. Yes, I'm ready. for Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Kay Jackson, and this is another special segment of This Week in Global Health, or TWIG. And we're going to be interviewing uh, a former professor of mine, whose name is Dr. Raywat Dianandan, and he is currently in Ottawa, uh, Canada at the moment, and I'm in Stockholm, so I'm a bit more awake than he is. Um, but we just wanted to <laughs> take off from some of the previous episodes that we've done on kind of career development and the uh, upcoming global health spheres and what how global health is changing over the years. And so uh, Ray has previously or has just recently done a, kind of a paper, or a, I think a podcast as well, he can explain a bit more about the upcoming global health challenges. I think that's really relevant for students, young professionals, uh, people that are looking um, at what's coming in the couple, next couple of years down the pipeline for global health. So Ray, if you want to introduce yourself and, and start off with what you think the upcoming global health challenges are. Thank you, Katie Jackson. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on here. My name is uh, Dr. Raywat Dionandan at the University of Ottawa. And uh, what I'll be talking about today, if Katie, that's me, is um, some work we did recently on, on trying to gauge what the so-called experts think is coming down the pipeline in terms of global health. And I presented this recently at a conference here in Ottawa that I recorded and it streamed off of my website. So if you go to my website, which is my last name, dionandon.com, um, and click on podcast, you will see it there along with the slides. So what we did essentially was we just looked at the literature uh, to see uh, where the so-called experts, and I don't mean to be disrespectful when I say so-called, but what is an expert really? I don't know. Uh, what the so-called experts are saying about um, what's coming down the pipeline. And I, and I want to say that in the history of telling the future, no one has ever been good at it. So I have I have absolutely zero expectation that what I'm going to say will actually come to pass because no one's ever done projections and uh, been anywhere near as accurate as we hope they, they are. But um, one thing I do want to say is when we talk about these um, these projections, don't consider them all to be threats. Think of it as a SWOT analysis, SWOT, strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. So some things that appear to be problematic and threatening may in fact be opportunities. Opportunities either for individual career enhancement or opportunities for innovation 
in solving some of these problems and maybe making the world doubly better by approaching things in more creative, sustainable <laughs> fashion. That's correct English, by the way. Doubly better. <laughs> hey, it's 8 a.m. here, and I'm just got out of bed. All right, so um, if I can start going through some of the stuff we found. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip over, a, a, it's a long list of, of, of things that we identified, but some of the important ones were um, climate change, obviously, of course, will dominate, I believe, the agendas of pretty much the rest of everyone else's life. And most of the scenarios are somewhat apocalyptic, if I can use that word. Um, but when it comes to, to, to health, uh, it's impossible to talk about any large health change without including some mention of the changing climate, whether it's disease vectors and disease states or agriculture. And that's a good segue into what I think will actually be the biggest change in global health and development, and that is agriculture. It's, it, there was an article in The Lancet recently that suggested that maybe it's time for those of us in health and development to step aside from the main stage and allow different players to take the lead in suggesting what is best for the betterment and health of individuals in the world. And those new players, it's been suggested, should come from the agricultural sector and the energy sector. I don't mean oil barons, I mean you know scholars in, in, in renewable energy. And the reason for this is um, there's a, a growing consensus that maybe investments and in work in these fields are the things that will incrementally have measurable positive effects on people's lives. And so if we can improve the quality of food, if we can improve the distribution of food, and, and also the distribution of where proper foods can be grown around the world given the change in climate, that's going to have a profoundly uh, important change on, effect on people. And energy, well, as the price of oil increases, everything's going to change. So um, the price of our food is going to change, the price of travel, carbon footprints, all these things are dependent ultimately on, on the price of oil. And when that becomes untenable for a lot of countries, institutions will crumble and we will see dramatic, profound paradigm shifts in a variety of, of, of levels of human, human society. So. Uh, it's hard to have this conversation without allowing for the fact that those two sectors will just interweave through our entire conversation. But now that I've acknowledged that fact, we can move on and talk about some of the um, more pedantic and mundane aspects of, of what we projected. And among them is the growing role for information technology. So the digital divide is something the scholars talk a lot about, that how um, much of the world hasn't entered the digital age. That's not true anymore. With the growth of India and China, they, in fact, in many ways uh, lead um, the digital revolution. Um, but uh, as more resources and more human interaction goes online, the more it becomes a stage for health law for the expression of human rights, of the denudement of international borders, of how we express ourselves as a human animals. And these more existential questions will percolate through how we define development initiatives. So it's impossible to do any sort of long-term planning without considering the role of communications technology. So keep that in mind at all times. Another thing that comes up is the changing role of clinicians. And this makes those of us who aren't clinicians a little happy <laughs> in a sort of schadenfreude kind of way. But there's a, a, a defocusing of the role of, of the doctor at the center of healthcare. And we've been calling for this for a long time, but now some of the experts are saying the time is finally here. And we see it expressed in subtle ways, like in some low and middle in, uh, income countries where um, people are being trained to be medical extenders more than being nurses or doctors. So individuals who can give care without necessarily being a certain class of individual. And yeah, also, I've noticed that also in the, like not only in the training programs that have existed, but the call for certain positions. There's a stronger community health worker, and I feel like even that word perhaps has either been invented or become. Um, quite large in, in only recent years, maybe five, ten years, this community health worker role. Um, but I think it's been really interesting, and, and it leads to a certain, to a few things. One being, you know, reaching the rural populations that it's not going to be one doctor. Um, I think it also decreases the brain drain um, that of that doctors experience from low-income countries, and I think also it means that they can be a um, lower level of in-depth education, but still largely skill-based that can help more specifically with specific situations. Am I right? To, to be honest, I don't fully believe this. 
even though I've just, I just came out of my mouth and this is what the experts are saying, I don't fully believe it because we've been saying this for decades. And ever since right. the barefoot doctors of China, we've been saying this is the future. The Alma-Ata Declaration and, um, you know, the, uh, uh, I forgot the other declaration it's called, but uh, these attempts to move healthcare to decentralize it going on for decades. But a couple of things are inspiring. First is, again, the information technology revolution, which allows a non-specialist to access knowledge right. in, a, in an immediate sense. Second, there was, there was an app launched, and apparently it's gaining in popularity. It was on BBC News of Instagram for doctors. Yeah, there it is, right. Photos. So cool. Yeah. Right. And the second is the growth of middle income countries like India and China, particularly mm -hmm. India, that is sucking a lot of um, the previously high income positions from from North America and Western Europe like radiologists so now uh, you can email your x-ray to India overnight and get a, a well-trained radiologist to look at it for pennies rather than pay thousands of dollars here in North America so that has shifted the economic uh, balance significantly such that the value of that specialty has come down in the global marketplace right? and that is also affecting the brain drain so all these things are interrelated obviously right? mm -hmm. so um, Everyone talks about the rise of the NCDs as being the focus of the next few decades. Right. And, and, you know, as you know, this is part of the epidemiologic transition into the age of so-called man-made and, and chronic diseases. Um, I'm hesitant to go full throttle behind that movement to, um, to mobilize resources in that direction because as we see there's still a lot of infectious disease out there. We were in the midst of an Ebola outbreak, for example, right now. And I think um, one of the crises just just around the corner is, of course, the crisis of um, antibiotic resistance bacteria, right? And, and so um, it is terrifying. So I, I think that's a battle that's yet to be had, and it's a little premature to say we're into the eras of N of NCDs until you know that war is upon us. Right. Okay. Um, as I scroll down my slides here. <laughs> um, Mental health, people talk about a lot now. Now, with the invention of the daily, the uh, disability adjusted life year, mental health came onto the scene as a player in this larger discussion, because now we can measure you know, things that don't necessarily kill you, but can make your life miserable as being important uh, factors in global health. Now, we all agree that addressing and looking at mental health issues around the world is important. However, no one's doing it. <laughs> the, the money is still not yet there, and I wonder what it will take to bring the money there. And I think what it will take is a global effort to centralize diagnoses and definitions, because the definition of mental health conditions are culturally defined, and there, and I think there is a movement now to sort of bring that uh, to the fore. Now, going does, back... Does mental health not fall under the NCDs? Does, if, if, does, if the NCDs have a big movement now, does mental health not then become centralized among them? That's a good point. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and I, I've separated them out because it's, it's such a different conversation in many ways. Right. Right. It's, it's not, you know, it's not just clinicians. It's other kinds of, of, of stakeholders talking about mental health. But it, but it does intersect the information technology revolution because what I've observed is that the um, the one player that kind of transcends the national boundaries and the cultural boundaries are the big data players, the ones who can use social media data to yeah. to in a, a meta sense measure the prevalence of mental health conditions. And I always point to Mood of the Nation, a project you know, I think it was Ireland that looked at live Twitter data to show probably probably the distribution of of, of depression in that country in real time. Right. And that was so inspiring that it's it's caused a lot of people to look at maybe the data exists under the surface of primary collected data um, right. that can right. give us a handle on mental health. So if we can if, if we can access that sort of that that uh, subcutaneous level of wisdom, that maybe the money will flow after that. We'll see. Okay, interesting. Okay. Um, governance seems to be something that's important. So um, by governance. We're talking about several layers of governance. Obviously, there's government governance, um, how governments are looking at the responsibilities around uh, international health. The Ebola crisis has actually put this back in the forefront because right. what many of us are arguing, as, as you, you're probably aware, is that um, the crisis has a lot to do with our failure to invest in certain global public goods, among them surveillance, among them rapid response, and among right. them uh, a withdrawal from the responsibilities of higher income nations to the... Yeah, there's been, there's been a really interesting um, 
photo, I guess, or, or maybe not photo, like graphic that has circulated recently on, on social media that has done uh, a depiction of, a, you know, a hospital full of beds and, and dark-skinned people who are mm -hmm. sick, and there's one light-skinned person, and there's three reporters around this one light-skinned person. I think that, that Ebola has taught us that borders are not as important when it comes to disease, and this, like you said, this idea of a governing system or, or public policies that protect everybody is really coming to the forefront. Right, and um, I fear, though, that we'll forget about it until the next crisis again. Because this is a conversation that does come up. It came up with SARS. It came up in the last flu epidemic. Um, yeah. This is a little scarier, though, for a lot of people. But beyond the governmental governance, there's also NGO and institutional governance. So um, NGOs are suffering around the world because financial models are not as robust as they used to be. I know a lot of executive directors of NGOs who are taking pay cuts to keep their organizations afloat. So no one knows how to sustain these groups anymore. They, they have a history of, of relying upon grant money. And so a change in their focus is long overdue. And to be a little um, negative for a second, um, one of the problems NGOs have had for several decades is they have taken the role of government. They have relieved government of responsibility they should have. Some countries where you know um, they've actually allowed the government to expend money on military, for example, instead of public health because the NGOs have paid for the public health. Right. So a shift in that approach is long overdue, and, and some people feel that it's coming. And with, with that comes the arrival of the private sector. Um, and it seems unavoidable that the future of global health and development requires some degree of heightened partnership between the public and private sector. What that will look like, who knows. Um, it may look like the need to invest in endeavors that are for profit. Not about giving money anymore, it's about investing with an expectation of a return on investment. That is problematic, obviously. Historically, that usually means um, uh, increased wealth and development for a large middle class and marginalization of an extreme lower class. But that's, you know, we're not talking about here what, what should happen. We're talking about what probably will happen. Right. So, so those, are the, those are the major takeaway points. And, and if I can finish with uh, some recurring themes, um, one of them is um, an increased focus, hopefully and probably, on information systems that may go hand in hand with surveillance systems. The second is um, different kinds of new collaborations among possibly online, um, possibly, I didn't mention this important part, possibly with leadership from previously poor nations. So we used to call this South-South partnerships, but now we're seeing you know, the heightened investment by countries like China with a whole new development model as they go into Africa that's different from the Western development model. Right, so these nations are taking a leadership role and we in the West often, they're not even on our radar what, what their activities are. And that's a problem. You know, and I think they will probably be in the primary leadership role come 50 years from now. Okay, interesting. Okay, well, thank you so much for, for identifying those for us and talking about kind of the upcoming challenges you identified in global health. Very interesting, very broad. Um, and uh, I know that you said it's kind of impossible to, for someone to predict what will happen, but um, I think that those are, will be at least themes that we will see. So uh, thanks for identifying that. My pleasure, and go to my website if you want to hear that, uh, that presentation. It's uh, dnandon.com. Click on podcast. Thank you. Excellent. Perfect. Okay, well, uh, thanks again for your time, and we'll stop here.